Well, one of the major questions that I wanted to ask you raised, that what is truth? It goes back to who do you trust? Um, I am an analyst for CNN, and now people judge my reporting as per which network I'm on and their decisions as to where they put that network in their system of tribes. So I understand across the Middle East how people do the same thing with, oh, if you watch Al Jazeera, this means this. Um, if you watch another channel. Qatar has had a story to tell and an unwilling audience and its neighbors. How can you change their minds? Well, uh, that's a loaded question, as you can uh, imagine. It has many elements uh, to it. Uh, one, uh, categorizing people and categorizing um, entities, etc. As much as possible in the state of Qatar, we try to kind of deviate from uh, what we call the politics of axes in the region. And maybe as a small state, we are in a, in a good position not only to do that, but actually to try and diffuse the politics of axes and hence polarization in the region. Um, everyone uh, starts with a, with, a, with a biased position by, by the very nature of our existence uh, as, as human beings. That's true. But I think that there are three criteria that anyone, any platform should follow. Um, and accordingly, we can describe them as objective people, objective ana analysts, objective uh, outlets and channels. Uh, one. Uh, are we verifying the facts, right? When we receive information, are we verifying this or not? That's uh, one screen. The other screen, are we allowing multiplicity of opinions? So, Kim, I mean, when you have, let's say you host someone uh, in a panel, do you make sure that you have the right balance of people and opinions and diversity of, of uh, regions, uh, opinions, ideologies, and so on and so forth? So that's the second screen. And the third one is not to disinform, not to do it intentionally, because sometimes you would report something thinking that it is true, and this happens. But if you do it on purpose, then this becomes uh, problematic. Um, and that's why, if I may tie this back to the question that I ended my slides with, can authoritarianism be reintroduced in the region? In other words, can we still monopolize the message in the region? And the answer that we understand in Qatar is no. Unfortunately, some other actors in the region think that they can monopolize the, the message, which is impossible in an age of social media, right? Now, are you very diplomatically referring to Saudi Arabia, the UAE, Bahrain, Egypt, all the frontline states trying to hold the blockade together? I, yeah, I, I leave it to everyone's intelligence. I mean, let's look at the landscape, right? Who is allowing human rights groups to enter their countries? And who's not, right? I mean, only a couple of months after the blockade of Qatar, uh, the director of Human Rights Watch was actually in Qatar on uh, Al Jazeera criticizing the uh, conditions of the migrant workers. So you can draw the contrast there. But we go back to the question of, okay, how do you get um, a group of, you know, as um, the minister was saying this morning, essentially all extended family, but how do you get everyone to believe the same thing? Who becomes the guarantor of information that can be trusted? Is it the UN? Could it be the US? Because I, I as a reporter, um, I talk to your ambassador in DC, I talk to officials from your country, and they say, look, we had a problem with terrorist financing. Mm -hmm. Here's what we've done. We've taken all of these steps. I've talked to Treasury officials who've embedded in your uh, Treasury system and say there's been real progress made, but it's, it's a glass half full situation. Then I talk to um, other Gulf countries and they say, but this, this, this. Yeah. And so who can be the person who gives the report card that everyone will believe in an age when everyone seems so divided? So once again, that's, that's a very loaded um, uh, question. To start with, I mean, the countries that are making those allegations against Qatar are not in a position at all to make those allegations because they're suffering from their own uh, uh, problems uh, as well. So this is as a starting point. Now, do we need to have one opinion in this region? 
the answer is simply is no. We just need to unify our general principles, our threat perceptions, the basic, basic and fundamental values, and then we can disagree with everything else, right? So and we can find a mechanism to negotiate our differences, Kim. By the way, the GCC Charter has a mechanism to resolve conflicts should they occur. Our neighbors, unfortunately, decided not to resort to those mechanisms. Yet yeah, that said, we think dialogue is still possible. Coming back to the uh, table of negotiations is still possible. But with, I mean, keeping in mind that there needs to be a respect for the sovereignty of each single country, each member to the GCC. So is there any movement towards dialogue at all? At one point of time, there was a movement. I mean, the Kuwaiti mediation never stopped, and we thank them very much for that. Uh, yet each time there is a movement, we're surprised that there is another move, a counter move, from one of the blockading uh, countries. This is the reality of the situation. Only recently, um, there was a movement, and then a uh, message, uh, a statement came out of, uh, from uh, Saudi Arabia. I mean, literally out of the blue. Uh, and we didn't even understand the context and the reasons behind that except that there was an effort to mediate. So let's talk about some of the relationships that they point out. Um, that uh, Ali Velshi had an excellent question um, about the relationships that Qatar maintains that are able to lead to some positive movement. Um, you have to have someone talking to uh, the Ikhwan Muslimin or Hamas or talking to Tehran for there to be diplomatic negotiation. How did your country find itself in that position and, and how can you uh, convince others that that's a positive and not a negative? It comes from a principle that has, uh, Qatar has about being a trusted partner and a mediator. And for you to become a mediator, you need to have a neutral stance towards all the par all parties of, of that specific conflict, right? And this has been our approach. Um, some of our neighbors who tried to play that role did not understand that element of neut neutrality. Uh, and instead of mediating, they tried to impose their agendas on this party or that party, and that's why they failed. As simple as that. The situation with Iran um, has gotten quite tense. Mm -hmm. And before the border situation in Syria, um, Iran was all anyone was talking about in this region. Uh, I understand from uh, diplomats in neighboring countries that they're very concerned that as they are allies of the United States, if the US in any way hits Iran militarily, that they will suffer the fallout. Um, where does Qatar stand in this confrontation? What can you do to help step it down? I think we need to take a step back and just look at the uh, entire situation in, in its totality. If something happens in this region, the entire world will be affected. Let's take only one factor, the security of the energy sector. Qatar alone contributes 30% of the LNG market globally. Let's imagine for a moment that this you know, has stopped, for example. What's going to happen to the oil prices, LNG prices, energy market? What's going to happen to Japan that depends on Qatar? 60% of Japan's consumption comes from Qatar. What's going to happen to the UK? 30% of the UK's consumption comes from Qatar. What's going to happen to India, to South Korea, to China, to Singapore, and so on and so forth? So the consequences of, of that and the ramifications of any military escalation is going to affect everyone. And that's why oftentimes I'm a bit surprised when this question is only asked to Qatar, whereas the international community needs to answer this question. Do you have any fears of what would happen to Qatar being caught in the crossfire? You have a large US military base here. Just possibly some of the attacks could be launched from here. No, Kim, I mean, let's talk about the facts on the ground today. You um, listen to the uh, statements from the State Department, uh, statements from the White House, statements from uh, the Iranian side. All of them say very clearly that none of them 
wants an escalation, a mili definitely not a military escalation. By the way, even our neighbors who have been having that discourse uh, against Iran for military escalation, as soon as they saw the first signs of that, their position changed completely. Which is a good thing, by the way. I mean, the fact that we are engaging, at least with this matter, uh, in a rational manner, uh, that's good. But has the state of Qatar asked the U.S. not to launch any attacks against Iran from here, from the large base that's here? I mean, the United States officials did not propose that in the first place. So it's very difficult for us to act upon hypothetical scenarios. Um, just going to try to, you know, stop some disinformation <laughs> before it starts sure. by asking that question. Um, I do want to ask about Syria. Um, you have um, Turkey was here when Qatar needed it most when the blockade was first announced, but Turkey is also doing something right now um, along the border that is getting international criticism. The other thing that's happening is that the U.S. is being criticized for leaving one of its allies um, at the mercy of another one of its allies. What is your takeaway from watching this situation? So I, I cannot speak on behalf of, of the U.S., uh, but then in terms of the part that pertains to Qatar, um, I think it's very important that we look at this situation uh, through the uh, lens of... Um, Two factors, basically. One, the fact that, Qatar, uh, that Syria is not a natural state that is going through a natural or natural circumstances. This is a country that has been torn apart by war for the past seven years. You have many non-state actors. You have many groups. You have many regional and international powers, all in, that, in the Syrian arena, if you wish. This makes the borders of Syria very uncontrolled, very insecure. That's uh, one factor. The other factor is the threat perceptions that the neighbors of Syria uh, have as well, right? Uh, whether we approve of that or not, some neighbors of Syria think that certain groups, certain sects, constitute a national security threat. So we cannot analyze the situation without taking into consideration those two uh, factors. But Qatar is a member of the ISIS coalition, and arguably what's happening right now is allowing the release of hundreds, if not thousands, of ISIS fighters, ISIS families, whereas possibly another option could have worked. If the U.S. had kept its troops there, it could have forced some sort of rapprochement, some sort of discussion between the SDF and Turkey? So the headquarter, actually, of anti-ISIS coalition is based here in Doha. Mm -hmm. And Doha, Qatar is still a member of, of that. Now, speaking of disinformation, since this is our topic, I'm not sure how accurate this description is. I mean, this is exactly what we heard uh, from uh, the Syrian regime, for example, in the, in the beginning of the crisis, etc. Uh, so once again, we need to verify the facts when it comes to that. I'm, so, I'm being very, I'm not trying to, to avoid the answer. I'm just being very precise here. I, and I can just say as a uh, reporting for Time magazine, yes. we filed a piece overnight that yes, U.S. officials do believe that between 700 to several thousand ISIS prisoners and fighters and family members have well, Once again, escaped. this needs to be reported officially mm -hmm. uh, to look into the facts. Uh, uh, that said, let's remember that Turkey played a role in fighting ISIS. As a matter of fact, the role that Turkey played, and once again, I don't want to speak honestly on, the, on their behalf. I mean, they have their spokespeople as well. Uh, but then they played a role in, in, in uprooting uh, um, ISIS uh, from Syria. And let's remember, they're still a NATO member uh, with, the, with the U.S., so they're still part of, of many other operations that are meant to maintain security in this region and beyond. I can see why you were named the uh, diplomatic spokesperson, because you are very carefully not criticizing the U.S. or Turkey in this case. I'm just stating the facts here. Uh, so in the time we have left, I'd like to take the opportunity to ask a, a slightly off-topic question. 
um, about uh, women's rights in Qatar. There have been uh, a lot of great strides made in the past couple of decades. Um, you are in this very uh, prestigious and powerful position, um, but you're also uh, a, a graduate of Oxford University, um, a scholar in your own right, a policy maker, maker before you came to this job, and yet it seems under Qatari law that there are still things that where you're not equal to a man. Is that what's on the books? How is it in practice? What needs to change? So Qatar went a long way uh, on this path of, of equality, gender equality. Um, and if we are to kind of draw an indicator, the indicator is still going up, meaning more rights for women. Uh, does this mean that we have full equality? I don't think so because we cannot point at, very difficult to point at a single country that has this full equality for a number of reasons. Part of it might be coming from policies, right? But part of it, and, and we know this, Kim, as as Hey, <laughs> I'm coming from a country that still has an elected woman president, so I'm one to talk, right? So, so but, but I mean, there is the glass ceiling that everyone talks about, isn't it? There are the social constructs that we have and we often struggle with. Uh, I still remember very well when uh, Her Highness Sheikha Moza first appeared on TV. That was a shock to the society, right? But uh, once again, sometimes the policies here in Qatar actually push uh, the limits uh, as well. I, how, how long ago was that? When that? That was more than, what was it, 20 years ago? Almost 20 years ago, yes. Okay. Yeah, so, and honestly, I'll, I'll tell you, um, can I just speak on, like in my personal capacity? Yeah, you can, as, you can, as, you can as, speak as, as off the record, I'll, I'll it's just, just us. Just take off the, the official hat. I keep, <laughs> I keep saying that my, at least personally, I am very grateful. I think most of my generation is very grateful for especially Her Highness Sheikh Hamoza, because I studied abroad. I never imagined. Okay, just because I'm speaking at my personal capacity. <laughs> no. um, so I never imagined in my life that I would end up studying abroad. And if, and if it wasn't for all those changes in the policies that started with His Highness the Father Amir, uh, and of course uh, Her Highness Sheikh Hamoza, many of us would have not pursued education abroad or in uh, some of the fine universities we have in Education City, be it Georgetown, be it Cornell, be it Texas A&M, and the list goes on. Well, in, my, uh, in the two minutes we have left, you gave us a presentation, but uh, we all know that you know, people like things boiled down to sure. under a couple of minutes. Sure. So what advice would you give people in this room, um, members of your own country who are watching, but also uh, people beyond for yeah. dissecting what is real from what is fake news? It's a very good question, and there isn't a straightforward answer to this. All I can say is um, we need to use our reason all the time, all the time, regardless of who is spreading the news, right? I mean, if we learned anything from the recent experiences, I think it's the fact that there isn't necessarily one trusted uh, um, uh, source of, of information. Not because they're necessarily intentionally trying to fabricate news, but because sometimes there's so much information that it is very difficult to, to discern rhetoric from reality. Uh, universities have a role to play in that. Politicians have responsibility to speak the truth to the best of their knowledge, to the best of their knowledge. Um, and then likewise, uh, uh, journalists have a huge responsibility upon the sh their shoulders as well to verify the facts, verify the information, not to disseminate uh, news that they're not 100% uh, sure about, to make it clear. I mean, oftentimes we mix up uh, opinions and, and facts to make it clear. When I'm speaking facts, I'm speaking facts. When I'm speaking opinions, I'm speaking opinions. Once again, I think I'm just giving general uh, advice that is known to, to, to everyone, but simply because there isn't a single right or correct answer. I, I would say that general advice is there, there are so many people who need to hear it and follow it. I mean, my, my own personal rules that I've learned the hard way, yeah. Don't retweet it unless you've read it. Absolutely. And if you don't want snarky, hateful messages 
on Facebook or anywhere in social media, don't pass it on. Um, but other than that, um, you have to, there are a, a, a few news outlets I trust, and one of the things I trust about them is that when they get it wrong, they say it and they quickly issue a correction. Um, but the other thing that I wish everyone understood is uh, being honest about, um, as a government, about what you do wrong also builds trust. Uh, do you feel you have the power to do that? No, absolutely, absolutely. This is uh, a rule of thumb for us uh, here in Qatar. All of us who are responsible for the communication portfolio, I mean, there are many instances, instances, I don't have the time maybe to kind of spell them out right now, but where we corrected information, where we said that this was not right, uh, um, and we updated it, uh, and sometimes we have uh, at least a recent instance, we, we can talk about it off the record, where uh, one of the officials um, actually had to come out uh, publicly and uh, correct something that he has said. So we don't say anything unless we're 100% sure that this is accurate. So with that, we all know that one of the ways to truly trust a government is when it can admit when it's wrong. Absolutely. Your Excellency, thank you very much, and thank you to the forum. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Appreciate it.